I do want to join in in welcoming you this morning. We're thankful for your presence. We invite you, if you will, to take your Bibles and open them with us. You can open them to 1 Kings 17, or you can open them to James chapter 5. We'll be dealing with both of those texts in our lesson today. We started a study last week of Elijah. We'll conclude that study with this lesson. In Elijah, we talked about the fact that he is known for three great things in Scripture. He is known for his passion. He is known for his power. And he is known for his prayer. We talked about his passion and his power last week. We want to talk about uh, his prayers this week. We talked about the other two things first because they really precede his prayers. uh, But they are most evident within his prayers. It is in his prayer life that we see his passion. And it is in his prayer life that we see his power. And so I think that we will enjoy our study together today of Elijah, this great man of prayer. It is interesting that when you read the record of the Old Testament, beginning in 1 Kings 17 and through the context of the life of Elijah, that we do not read there that Elijah prayed that it might not rain. He appears on the scene in 1 Kings 17 with a message for Ahab. Ahab is a wicked king. His father was Omri. His father had been the most wicked king up to that point. But his son Ahab excelled even him. He was the most wicked king that Israel had ever had. And he excelled in wickedness, not only personally, but he went and he married Jezebel. And that was uh, exceedingly wicked. In fact, it is interesting that we do not read about the wives of the other kings. The Bible is silent concerning them, but the Bible is not silent concerning Jezebel. And there is a reason why she is mentioned, because she increased the wickedness of this king. And God had reached a point to where something had to be done about Israel's sins. Something had to be done about Ahab and Jezebel, and he selects Elijah to be the one to go and to deliver a message to them. And the message that Elijah delivers to King Ahab is, As the Lord liveth, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years according to my word. Elijah makes very clear to the king, God is alive. You act as if God is dead. You have made Baal your God. You act as if Baal is the one that is giving you rain and fruitful seasons. Elijah says, I want you to know that Jehovah God is alive. And you're about to learn that he's alive. I am his servant. I stand before him. I stand with him, Elijah says. He's my God. And you're going to see that my God is alive. There's not going to be dew. The land of Palestine especially depends heavily upon dew. We take dew for granted. Dew does not provide a great deal of moisture for us. It does provide some, but we don't really think about that because we have plenty of rainfall in addition to that. But in a land where you do not have much rainfall, dew is extremely important. They were not going to have dew. They were not going to have rain. And notice that at the moment that Elijah makes this prediction, he says these years. He's already telling Ahab, this is not going to be a month without rain. This is not going to be six months without rain. There are going to be years without rain. This is going to be a long, drawn-out drought that falls upon the land. No doubt for some time the land continued to do okay. But there came a point that with each passing month, and then there came a point with each passing week, And then there came a point with each passing day. And then there came a point with each passing hour. The land grew more and more parched until it became desperate to find water. It became desperate to find grass. It became desperate to find anything green. 
And we'll see that as we move through the book. But in 1 Kings, we're not told that Elijah prayed that it might not rain. We're simply told that he shows up one day before the king with that message. It's not until we get to the New Testament, it's not until we get to the book of James, that we find the reason why Elijah showed up with that message. Elijah showed up with that message because Elijah had been praying that it might not rain. And God had answered that prayer, and he sent Elijah with a message to deliver it. In James chapter 5 and verse 16, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man, subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not upon the earth for the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. James is the one that tells us about Elijah's prayer. And James is making a point to these first century saints. And the point is this. Elijah's your hero, but Elijah was just a man. He was a man who faced the same temptations that you faced. He was a man who was faced the same weaknesses that you have. And he prayed, and his prayer was effective. His prayer availed much. And so just like Elijah prayed that it might not rain, and it didn't rain until he prayed again that it might rain, and then it, it rained, he said, you can pray, and your prayers can avail much. James is not telling them, perhaps, to pray that it wouldn't rain, or that it would rain. But rather, he was telling them, you can pray and your prayers can be powerful. Your prayers can be effective. Yes, you're just a man, but so was Elijah. And he prayed and his prayers were powerful. So there's great hope in this passage for us that though we are but men, and though we are weak, and though we are frail, and though we are not perfect, we can wield great power when we're down on our knees in prayer. We want to spend our time in this lesson talking about how Elijah prayed. How he prayed. Because I want to pray like he prayed. I want my prayers to be as effective. I want my prayers to avail as much. I want my prayers to be as powerful as his were. And so I want to learn from his life how he prayed. First of all, I want you to notice that he prayed earnestly. When he prayed, he prayed earnestly. Verse 17 says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed, underline it, earnestly. He prayed earnestly. The word earnestly there deals with emotion. It deals with energy. It is the idea that here's this passionate man who prayed with passion. Here's this powerful man who prayed with power. He didn't merely pray, but he poured himself out in prayer. This was not a memorized prayer. This was not a prayer that he had prayed a hundred other times. This was not a prayer without feeling or without meaning. This was a prayer where Elijah put his heart, he put his soul, he put his emotion into it. He prayed earnestly. It reminds us of the prayer that Christ prayed in Hebrews 5 and verse 7 where the Bible says that he prayed with strong crying and tears. Crying and tears. Strong in those things. Jesus prayed with passion in the garden. Luke 22 and verse 44 says, He being in agony, prayed more earnestly. He was in agony. He was agonizing which deals with this struggle that he was going through. But in the midst of that struggle, he prayed more earnestly. I can't imagine that Jesus prayed ever without earnestness. I can't imagine that Jesus prayed ever without great emotion. But the Bible says he prayed more earnestly. He prayed with even more emotion, more passion on this occasion than on other occasions. And that seems to be the case with Elijah and with a prayer that he prayed. Some have compared it to Jacob wrestling with uh, the man of God in Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. You remember that Jacob wrestled with this man of God. 
And the man of God prevailed not. Jacob was holding his own in this wrestling match. I don't know that it was that the man of God was allowing him to hold his own, but Jacob was putting a lot into it. He was wrestling with him. I do know that this man of God at any moment could have overcome Jacob because he reached out and touched his hip and his hip was out of joint just that quickly, just that easily. But even when Jacob's hip was out of joint, Jacob still doesn't turn loose. That's pretty good. You put my hip out of joint, I'm turning loose. You can go. You can do what you want to do. I'm worried about myself at that point. I'm going to deal with my own pain. You can go. But now Jacob, Jacob has a hole. You can put his hip out of joint. Jacob's not turning loose. It begins to be daylight, and Jacob says, I'm not going to turn you loose unless you give me a blessing. I would have asked for him to fix my hip, personally. But he asked for a blessing. Give me a blessing, and I'll turn you loose. Well, that's the attitude, that that's the determination, that's the emotion, that's the passion with which we ought to hold on. We ought to be wrestling. Putting forth great energy, putting forth great emotion. We may think about as well, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15, where we read about Hannah's prayer. Hannah's praying. Hannah's life is not as it should be. Hannah's only one of the two wives. The other wife is able to have children. She isn't able to have children. The other wife torments her. He's in a difficult position. She's praying to God. And Eli sees her praying. And she is so emotional, she is so distraught in this prayer that Eli assumes that she's drunken. He assumes that she's had too much to drink. But she explains, I'm just a sorrowful spirit. I'm just overcome with emotions. I'm not overcome with wine. I'm overcome with emotions. I'm overcome with sorrow. And she said, I pour out my soul unto the Lord. I'm pouring myself out in my prayer, in my request of the Lord. That's praying earnestly. And I'm convinced that many times we don't pray with that kind of earnestness. We pray cold, we pray formal, we pray memorized prayers. We don't pray with heart and soul. We don't pray with great determination holding on. We don't pray with this great sorrow of spirit. We don't pray with pouring out our souls. But Elijah did. Hannah did. Jesus did. Jacob did. That's what we need to do as well. But now let's think about a second way that Elijah prayed. He prayed specifically. The Bible says he prayed earnestly that it might not, and you ought to underline it, that it might not rain. Jacob didn't merely pray that something might happen. Jacob didn't merely pray that somehow Ahab's attention might be gotten. He didn't pray that somehow Israel might see the error of their ways. He prayed specifically. He prayed that it might not rain. Now, this, this is a scriptural prayer because in Deuteronomy chapter 11, God had warned His people, if you don't obey my voice, I'm going to close up the heavens. You're not going to have any rain. I, I'm going to quit giving you my blessings if you don't listen to my voice. Elijah knew that. He's praying in accordance with that scripture. And he's asking God, God, keep your promise. You've warned us that if we don't obey you, you're not going to give us rain. God, I'm asking you to withhold the rain. I'm asking you to remind Israel of that passage of Scripture. I'm asking you to remind Israel that there are consequences to disobedience. God, you close up the heavens. You close up shop. You quit letting your rain fall until Israel is brought to her knees and Israel looks again to you and Israel listens to you and obeys you again. He's praying specifically that it might not rain. Now, as we think about this specific prayer, that it might not rain, it is in Romans 11 and verse 2 that Paul says, What you not, what the Scripture says of Elias, that he made intercession to God against Israel. Now, generally speaking, when we talk about intercession, we're talking about making intercession for someone. 
We're making intercession on behalf of someone, and we generally assume that that intercession is made in interceding for good for someone. Asking God to bless someone, asking God to help someone, asking God to show mercy to someone. That's generally how we think about intercession. That's not the intercession of Romans 11 and verse 2. He made intercession against them. Not for them, He made intercession against them. Have you ever done that? Have you ever made intercession against someone? Have you ever prayed against a certain situation? You ought to. There's, there's Bible for that. There's Bible for making intercession against someone. Should we not make intercession against false teachers? Absolutely we should. We should be asking God to defeat them. God, for God's people to identify them, for elders and preachers and others to deal with them. We ought to be making intercession against them. We ought to be trying to make their work, we ought to be trying to make their efforts to divide and, and to deceive God's people as hard as we possibly can. We ought to be asking for every roadblock imaginable to be put within their way so they can't do what they want to do. The same is true when we talk about those who bring division and bring problems in other ways. We ought to be making intercession to God against them. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah made intercession against Israel, and it was effective. We ought to be thankful when people pray for us, and we ought to be afraid when people pray against us. When good people are making intercession against you, you ought to be extremely afraid because those prayers can and will avail much. Elijah did that. He made intercession against Israel. But as we think about this prayer, the interest, one of the interesting things about this prayer is that this prayer not only affected Israel, but this prayer affected Elijah. It made life uncomfortable for Elijah. First Kings 17 and verse 7, God sent him out to the, to the book Kareth. And this book has been providing him with water. God's been causing the ravens to bring bread and meat to him. Now, ravens are kind of an ominous bird. Um, they're a flesh-tearing kind of bird. They're unclean. But God commanded these unclean birds to go and gather up meat and bring it to Elijah. I, I trust they're getting stuff cooked and prepared and... God's taking care of the germs and all of that. I don't know. Uh, but I, I know that they're feeding Elijah and Elijah's eating what they bring. And he's drinking this book. But 1 Kings 17 verse 7 says, The day comes when the brook dried up because there was no rain in Israel. Elijah prayed that there might not be any rain. That meant that the brooks in Israel started drying up, and that meant that his own brook dried up. That meant that his own situation became harder. You know, there are going to be times in our lives when the brooks dry up. They just are. There are going to be times when, when jobs dry up. When I was in Texas, the man that, that drove... Jake and me to the airport is about third from the top of the fire department in the city of Austin. He's never going to get to the top. He says he's going to retire and enjoy life before he ever gets there. He's nearing that point now. But he said he got married and he was in construction and construction was going well. And then the day came when the construction industry just dried up. He didn't have a job. Had a wife, had a family, didn't have a job. Was going to congregation in Austin at the time, and there were a couple of people in that congregation who were firemen. They said, "Have you ever thought about being a fireman?" "No, no, I really haven't ever thought about being a fireman." "We can try to help get you on if you want us to." "I need a job. See what you can do." They got him on the fire department. At that point in his life, he changed careers. He's going to retire as a fireman. He said, "God's been good to me." But that first brook dried up, and he had to go to a second brook. Elijah's brook dries up. Elijah has to go and, and live with a widow, not even a widow in Israel, a widow of Zarephath and, and her son. 
I know that there are 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal, and so there must have been a home to which Elijah could have gone in Israel, but God's making a point. And Jesus later in Luke chapter 4 will say, God's making a point. God's making a point that sometimes God has to send His servants somewhere else to get help. He had to send Elijah to someone outside of Israel to get help because things were so bad in God's own land. There's so much corruption here. But this brook dried up. Sometimes jobs will dry up. Unfortunately, sometimes marriages dry up. Sometimes friendships dry up. Sometimes finances dry up. There are brooks in life that dry up. But if we'll trust God, God has a plan. God has a way of taking care of us. It may be in a strange place in a strange way. It may be outside of the land that we're comfortable. It may be in the home of someone that seems about as desperate and as about as bad of a situation as we're in. And this widow must have, she was down to her last cake. Her last oil. She didn't have anything. And God said her, Elijah to her to take care of him? Human perspective, that doesn't make sense. But it worked out well for her and for Elijah both. Because God took care of it. This brook dried up. Now, why did this brook dry up? Let's, let's trace everything back. Why did it dry up? Well, it dried up because there was no rain in Israel. Why was there no rain in Israel? Because Elijah prayed that there might not be any rain. And so Elijah prayed. His prayer was answered. But the answer of that prayer affected him also. I want to suggest something to you. Now, don't blame me for this, but I'm partially responsible for it. Don't fo- totally blame me for it. You know what gas prices are right now? Pretty high, right? You know what food prices are right now? Pretty high, right? You know how difficult it is to get by on what we're making right now? Pretty hard, isn't it? But you know what many of us have been praying We have been praying that something will wake our president, something will wake our Congress, something will wake our leaders up, something will get our nation's attention and remind our nation this nation was founded on Christian principles. This nation was founded on the belief that there's a God in heaven, that His Word is the standard that we're supposed to love Him, that we're supposed to love men, that we're supposed to conduct our lives in a certain way. And we've been praying for our nation to get back to that. I don't know what it's going to take to get our nation back to that, but I am suggesting that those prayers, when they are answered, may not only dry up the brooks for other people, they may dry up our brooks. They may make life harder for us for a while. Well, then I'm going to quit praying that. Then I'm going to quit saying that. I'm going to quit asking God for patience if I get patience by trouble. I'm going to quit praying that prayer because I don't want trouble. And so I'm going to quit asking for patience. That's not the answer. That's not the answer. What if Elijah had not prayed this? How hard would life have been? How hard would life have become had he not prayed this? You really think things were going to get better without some intervention? They only got better because God got Ahab's attention. God got Israel's attention. God made a declaration to them that they could not ignore. They had to depend upon God again. That's the only way that things got any better. To be honest with you, it's the only way things are going to get any better in our country. Is for men to have to look to God and rely on God again. Am I saying that God's brought all these things on us? No, I can't say that. I can't be dogmatic about any of those things. But I can say that there is a God that rules in heaven. There is a God that answers prayer. There is a God who wants our nation to return and be again what it needs to be. 
And that may very well be the answer to our prayers. And it's affecting us as well as everyone else. So we're paying more at the pump and we're paying more at the grocery store and we're dealing with some other difficulties in life. But if our nation comes to our, her senses, it will be worth everything we pay. Because if our nation does not come to her senses, our way of life is over anyway. Our nation's not long going to stand if there are changes. So it's time for us to bring those changes about. And we have to suffer as well. Buddy Ryan. Some of you know Buddy Ryan. Football coach. Character. He said there are two kinds of coaches in the NFL. Them that's been fired and them that's about to be fired. Well... Buddy Ryan had his share of those experiences. There are two kinds of Christians. I'll just be honest with you. Those that have been persecuted and those that are about to be persecuted. The Bible says that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's all. Not some. Not most. That's all. Everyone will. So there's two kinds of Christians. Those that have been persecuted and those that are about to be persecuted. And Elijah... Uh, was going to face that persecution. But he's praying, he's praying specifically that it might not rain. We need to be more specific in our prayers. He prayed effectively. Now James says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He says their prayers avail, their prayers are effective. Elijah's prayer was effective. Elijah prayed that it might not rain, and it rained, underline it, rained not. He prayed it, and it happened. How many times have you said prayers and it happened? You prayed for so-and-so to get well and they got well. You prayed for so-and-so and it happened. Elijah prayed that it might not rain and it didn't rain. His prayer was effective. James's point is your prayer can be effective also. There are many other prayers that he prayed, of course. First Kings 17 and verse 22, this widow's son dies. Just because Elijah's living with you doesn't mean you're not going to have problems in your life. Nor does it mean just because Jesus is living with you doesn't mean you're not going to have problems in your life. This woman's son died even though Elijah, the prophet of God, was living with her. The, the, the disciples got in the middle of a storm and just about perished even though Jesus was in the boat with them. It does not mean if you're a Christian that you're not going to have problems, that there are going to be difficulties in life. They're going to be. Even if Jesus is there, there are going to be problems and difficulties. And so there were problems and difficulties. Her son got sick and her son died. But Elijah prayed. And the Bible says that he revived. He came back to life in response to that prayer. In 1 Kings 18, 37 through 38, he prayed that God might send fire from heaven and fire fell from he heaven. Devoured the sacrifice, the stones, the wood, the licked up the water, everything was gone. As if there had never been anything there other than a scorched place on the earth. Prayer was answered. He prayed that it might rain, and it rained. He not only was capable of stopping the rain, he was capable of getting the rain going again through prayer. I don't, that would have been the scary part for me. The scary part for me is I pray and it, it stops raining and, and then I, I can't get it to rain again. I'm pretty good at taking things apart. I'm much, I have much more difficulty putting them back together again. I'm probably pretty good at praying that it might not rain, but I've got to pray at some point that it will rain and it's got to rain. It did. He prayed effectively. Our prayers can be as effective if we're dependent on God and trusting God. Uh, we, can, we can have the same response. He prayed repeatedly. Notice James 5 and verse 18. James says, And he prayed again. Prayed this time, then he prayed another time. He's a man of prayer. We see prayer. We see that he prays repeatedly. We need to pray as well. You remember in 2 Corinthians 12 that Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Don't know what that was. But whatever it was, Paul prayed that God might remove it from him. And he prayed three times for that. He prayed repeatedly that that might be the case. Jesus prayed the same words three times in the garden. Somebody says, well, doesn't the Bible tell us not to use vain repetition? Not to use the same words again and again, and yet Jesus prayed the same words three times on the same night. Is that not repetition? Absolutely, but it's not vain repetition. It's not vain repetition because every time Jesus prays it, He means it. 
Every time he prays it, he prays it with passion. He prays it with emotion. If you can pray the same words with the same passion and emotion, then more power to you. Say the same words again and again. But the problem with most of us is, as we use the same words, they become phrases that roll off our tongue without any thought or without any emotion. Then they become vain. It wasn't so with the Lord. It doesn't have to be so with us. And so, just because some guy gets up and says the same prayer every time does not mean, necessarily, that's vain repetition. It may lend itself to that. It may be moving in that direction. But if he's praying it with thought and he's praying it with meaning and feeling and emotion, it isn't vain repetition, even if it's the same words. So let, let's be patient and forbearing with one another when it comes to matters like that. Romans 12 and verse 12 says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant, or continuing actively, constantly in prayer. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. Matthew chapter 7 and verses 7 and 8 says, Ask, it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. For he that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, the door shall be opened. Now notice that... Verse 7 says, ask, seek, knock. The next verse says, asketh, seeketh, knocketh. It adds the E-T-H to the words. That E-T-H, beautiful part of the King James Version, means to continue to ask, continue to seek, continue to knock. And so it isn't a one-time asking, a one-time seeking, a one-time knocking. It is continuing to do that again and again and again. And that's what... Elijah's doing in his prayers. He's praying that it might not rain. How many times did he pray that? I don't know. Did he pray it just once? Did he pray it two times, three times, ten times? I don't know. But I know it was effective, and I know he prayed again. He prayed that it might not rain, and then he prayed again that it would. Let's, let's not forget to pray the second time. Let's not only pray that it might not rain, let's not forget to pray that it might start raining again. Now, the point is this. If we're praying that our president, and we're praying that our Congress, and we're praying that people might make some changes, that's great for us to pray that. But there may come the point at which we can pray for those blessings to be restored, for those blessings to come back, and we ought to pray that. And certainly when we pray for someone sick and they get well, we ought not to forget to pray and thank God for what He's done. We ought to pray again. That's the idea here. He prayed reverently. In 1 Kings 17, 20 and 21, where this widow's sons died, and he's restoring him to life, he prays, O oh Lord. He understands he doesn't have the power to bring this boy back to life. Only God has that power. He's very reverent, O oh Lord. He calls out to God, wants her to know on the mount. He calls out to God. He wants them to know this is not by my power. This is by God's power. Very reverent. The Bible says in Matthew 6 and verse 9, this is, by the way, not the Lord's Prayer. I, I hear more and more Christian people uh, say the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6. That is not the Lord's Prayer. That's the model prayer. It's not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is John 17. That's the Lord's Prayer. The model prayer, Jesus says, after this manner, therefore pray ye. The Lord didn't need to pray this prayer. This prayer contains things that he didn't need to pray. He didn't have any sins, didn't need any, didn't need to pray that. I need to pray that, you need to pray that. So it's a model prayer. It's teaching them how to pray. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There's great reverence in that prayer. He's teaching us to be reverent when we pray. But let's think about something else. He prayed personally. In 1 Kings 17, 20 and 21, he prayed, O Lord, my God. My God. He prayed personally. He, he addressed God as His God. Philippians 4 and verse 19, Paul says, But my God shall supply all your needs. If we're going to pray effectively, we're going to have to have a relationship with God. We're going to have to have built a relationship with Him. We're going to be able to say, The Lord is my shepherd. We're going to have to approach Him in that kind of a way if we're going to be able to pray effectively. He prayed unselfishly. In 1 Kings 17, 20 and 21, Elijah's praying for this widow. He's praying for her son. He's not praying for himself. 
He's praying for them. He's asking God on their behalf to do certain things. Well, the Bible teaches us that when we pray, we need to be unselfish in our prayers. We need to esteem others better than ourselves. We need to have the mind of Christ who thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation. He, he, he was concerned with us and our needs. In John 17, he's praying for the disciples. He's praying for what their needs are. He's praying that they might be one. He's thinking about us. We need to think about others when we pray. James chapter 4 and verse 3 says, Verse 2, you have not because you ask not. But in verse 3, you, you have not because you ask amiss. That you might consume it upon your lust. They were asking selfishly. Number one, you're not getting what you, what you need, James says, because you're not asking for it. But number two, when you do ask for it, you ask selfishly for it. God's not going to grant that. I, I, I'm, I heard the story of of a young lady that, that wanted to get married. And she knew that when she prayed, she wasn't supposed to pray selfishly. And so she wanted to meet a handsome young man and she wanted to get married, but she, she just didn't feel right about bowing her head and saying, God, provide me with a handsome husband. And so she said, God, please provide my mother with a handsome son-in-law. Well, that's better, isn't it? That may not be what it needs to be, but it's better. It's moving in the right direction. It's asking on behalf of someone else rather than on our own behalf. He prayed confidently. I love in 1 Kings chapter 18, when he's up on the mountain, that hasn't rained for, for three years and six months. And in 1 Kings 18 and verse 41... He tells Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. He said, Ahab, I hear rain coming. I hear an abundance of rain coming. Elijah, I don't hear anything. Elijah, there, there's not a cloud in the sky. There's not even a breeze blowing. You hear an abundance of rain I hear an abundance of rain. How did he hear that abundance of rain? He heard it by faith. That's how he heard it. We talk about seeing things by faith, and the, and the Bible certainly supports that. Noah saw things by faith, didn't he? Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. How did he see the, the coming flood. How did he see all of this rain, the heavens being open and pouring out of this water? How did he see that? Well, he saw it by faith. But do you realize that we can hear by faith as well? We, we, can, we can hear things by faith? Elijah heard this rain by faith. He couldn't see it. He couldn't physically hear it, but he could hear it by faith. He hears an abundance of rain coming. In 1 Kings 18, in that context... He's going to pray, and he's going to say to his servant, in verse 43, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. Seven times he does this. Go and look, 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 go and look. I've heard an abundance of rain. Elijah, there's not a cloud in the sky. Seven times. There's nothing, nothing, nothing. Elijah said, go one more time. He goes and he says, there's a cloud about the size of a man's fist. Not a very big cloud. You don't think about an abundance of rain coming from a cloud about the size of a man's fist. But by the time it rolls in, there's going to be a lot of rain. And he tells Ahab, Ahab, you better get in your chariot. You better head down because your chariot wheels are going to mar up in the mud. You're going to get to the point to where you won't be able to get off this mountain if you don't go right now. The rain's coming. He prayed confidently. We ought to pray with the same confidence. This is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And we know that if He hear us, we shall have the petitions that we desired of Him. Whatsoever we ask, we know that we shall have the petitions that we desired of Him. We have confidence. We pray with confidence. James says, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Mark 11 and verse 24 says we pray 
And we believe that He will give us the things that we're asking for. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8 says, We pray without wrath and without doubting. We pray in faith. Hebrews 4 and verse 16 says, We pray with great boldness. Finally, we see that He prayed humbly. 1 Kings 18 and verse 42, I want you to look at the way that Elijah prayed. The Bible says that he put his face between his knees. I know that that the position in which we pray does not necessarily say we're humble or we're not humble. I know that you can be humble standing and praying. I know that you can be pride and haughty down on the floor. I understand that. But I think given this context and looking at what Elijah does, you've got to say that Elijah is not trying to take credit for this. Elijah is not trying to give anyone the impression that he's the one making this happen. And so he prays and he puts his face between his knees. He can't see anyone. No one can see his face. He is not distracted by anything. And he's pouring out his heart to God in prayer. He's praying that it might rain, and it's going to rain. Luke chapter 18, Jesus told a parable about two men who went up to pray. There was a Pharisee and there was a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. Then he went ahead to talk about all the things that he did. The publican stood afar off. He didn't get up in the center. He wasn't in the middle of everything. He stood out to the edge. He wouldn't so much as lift up his eyes to heaven. He smote upon his breast. He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Which man went down to his house justified? Which prayer was heard and answered? The prayer of the man who stood and prayed with himself? The the prayer of the man who thanked God he wasn't like other men? The, The prayer of the man who told God all the good things that he did? Or the prayer of the man who wouldn't even lift up his eyes? Prayer of the man who says, I need mercy. I'm a sinner. That's the man who was heard. He prayed humbly. So we've learned from Elijah today how to pray. We talked about in the first lesson, Elijah was a man of like passions. He's just like us. But yet he had great power because he teamed up with God. And he was a man who prayed and his prayers were effective. You're just a man... But you've teamed up with God. And because you've teamed up with God, when you pray, your prayers can avail much. Don't, don't, don't neglect the privilege of prayer. This morning, those who are not Christians have the opportunity to become a Christian. You don't become a Christian through prayer, though. Now, that's a right given to those who are already Christians. To become a Christian, you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of all of your sins. Confess that Christ is the Son of God. Be immersed in water. Have all your sins washed away. That's the plan we read in Acts 2 and verse 38. That's the plan of Acts 22 and verse 16. Will you do that this morning? Those who are children of God do have the privilege of prayer. You have the privilege of being able to bow your head and pray to God and ask God to forgive you of your sins. And if they're of a private nature, you can do that in, in, in the privacy of your own home privacy of your car, those sins will be forgiven you. But if those sins are of a public nature, which means that they've been done in a way that others can know about them, it's not merely a thought that you've had in your head, but it's something you've said, it's something you've done, it's something that you may know that people know about, it's visible, or it may be something that was done in public, and so there may be people who know about it. You want to make sure that if anyone knows about this, they know that you're sorry about it. They know that you don't live, you don't want to live your life that way. That you don't think that's right. You want to be forgiven for it. Then we have the blessing that James is talking about in James 5 and verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. And that can be done this morning. If you're willing to confess those sins, you're penitent over them then your brothers and sisters in Christ will pray for you that those sins will be forgiven you. Then you'll be in good standing with God again. Then you'll be in a position to where you can pray again and your prayers be heard. We invite you to come this morning if you need to, as we stand, as we sing.